Hey everyone, welcome to Road Trip to Bliss. I'm here with Katie Green and we are going to have some amazing conversation today. She is a neurodivergent mental health coach and consultant. And Katie, I'm just going to leave it to you to uh, to introduce yourself more in detail. So tell me the story about how you got started and what uh, what's the story behind Hope Reignited Consulting and take it from there. Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Katie Green, founder of Hope Reignited Consulting. I got my start and my vision about 10 years ago. I wanted to help people create a life they did not need to escape from. I didn't know what that would look like. So initially I started pursuing a path of licensure. I was going to become a licensed therapist and I knew that I needed to get through education. I needed a minimum of a master's degree and supervised hours and all of that. And what ended up happening was <clears throat> it was extremely difficult to find placement for those hours. And I realized that I could work as an addiction counselor and get paid a little bit more, or at least like be assured that I would get paid because in many of the hours placements that I would find, um, it would be volunteer mm. or it would be connected to school. So I would do three days a week of classes and two days a week of placement um, for getting hours. And that didn't line up with my life or how I came to find later how my brain works. And so I had gone down a path of doing addiction counseling. And I was an addiction counselor for several years. I worked at an outpatient methadone clinic in San Fernando Valley, California. And I learned very quickly that when people are treating addiction, they are not just treating addiction. They are treating trauma. They're treating um, undiagnosed mental health issues, and they're treating complex family dynamics. Mm. And so what became of that, this was also through a pandemic. I was a an essential worker through a pandemic because I worked at a methadone clinic. And so I would see patients every single day um, <clears throat> because they needed their methadone. And had I not been in a medical setting, I would have been um, restricted to working virtually. So for somebody with my mind, with my neurotype, I'm autistic. For somebody with my mind, I need to be around people. I was living alone, and so if I was also ordered to work from home, that would be no sense of community, no belonging, no routine, which are so important for somebody that is autistic, and <clears throat> so that's that's how my experience was like as an addiction counselor, and as I stepped away from the clinical path, I invested in a business coach and I started to put my ideas to paper and started to bring my vision to life. And what I found was I found four distinct steps that I believe are key for people to sustain their recovery outside of the walls of therapy mm. I call this my focus four my focus four are self-advocacy somatic peace dignity preserving conflict resolution and emotional health related to emotion regulation and expression those if people can get very familiar and very comfortable with those four things, they will have an easier time at 
sustaining their recovery. It won't be easy, but at least it'll be more manageable than trying to do it on their own. And so this, the company that I created, Hope Reignited, is about giving people a second way of doing things, a second way of breaking cycles in their family that no longer serve them, Mm. a second way of breaking life controlling habits that they want to step away from because they believe themselves and their kids deserve better. Wow. That's awesome. And can you explain a little bit more in depth of what each four of those things mean exactly? Mm -hmm. So self-advocacy is the ability to stand up for yourself. Mm. It is the ability to ask questions without being afraid and ask questions without your inner voice just kind of talking you out of it. Because sometimes we'll get in a space where it seems like everybody knows this. (laughs) I'll just show up and Google the answer. And I don't actually need to ask anyone this. Nope, you do. <laughs> right? No dumb question. Google is often Google's often wrong or too many results and too that many results, yeah. And that gives some overload because there's too many options to sift through. And so self-advocacy is the reassurance and the knowledge that you are worthy of the information that you want. You are worthy of of asking questions without being made to feel small or stupid and self-advocacy is the ability to know your rights and stick up for them when somebody tries to walk over them because you deserve as much love and care as the next person I love that love that that's Um, huge somatic peace is about um, having peace within the body and having um, <clears throat> being friends with your body, not having um, not having stomach upsets, having regular bowel movements, having a steady sleep routine, um, having a good relationship with food and movement. I stepped away from saying exercise because I began to see movement for what it was, endorphins, quality time, Mm. and better sleep. When I was in the mindset of, I need to exercise, I need to do X amount of activities, or it became a numbers game. And for somebody who has lived with black and white thinking for years, I did not want to step into a numbers game. I didn't, I didn't want to deal with that. I just wanted to, I just wanted to focus on a group of people are going to play volleyball and it's going to be great because I'm not going to be, I'm not, it's not something I excel at, but I'm going to have a good time with my friends. It'll take the energy out of me so I can sleep better and I'll feel less stressed. That's how I, that's how I began to see exercise. And so the, and so somatic peace is really about building a friendship with your body. It is really about not putting your body through more stress. And when it encounters stress, because we are living in a stressful world, you have a plan to regulate, to calm yourself down and to self-soothe and it won't, the stress won't last as long because you have a plan. Right. Wow. I love movement versus exercise. That's yeah. Br- that's brilliant. People, I'm people using that. The, yeah. People in the people that have any sort of experience with disordered eating recovery will know, will absolutely know about the movement versus exercise discussion because wow disordered eating and exercise compulsion and difficult exercise mindsets and behaviors the two are actually best friends Mm. so if you fix your mindset with exercise if you fix your mindset with movement then 
your relationship with your body will also in general improve because wow you got to disconnect you got to absolutely disconnect from things that are numbers things that you can get compulsive over you got to d- disconnect from it it's interesting because uh i have also suffered from eating disorders uh from a very young age started mm-hmm. with started with anorexia um and and i couldn't even tell you where i came up with that like i don't i don't know how i had a very bad body image growing up mm-hmm. you know and and I had, I, I suffered with that. And then, you know, everybody around me was, I was, I had lost a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. And then everybody was like, you know, you got to eat, you got to eat, you got to eat. And then I became bulimic and mm-hmm. I dealt with that for a bazillion years. Yeah. Yeah. So this is really resonating with me, even, you know, hearing mm-hmm. this is that, like you said, that just the thought of exercise, just, you know, totally revolts me right yeah. but the movement I love this this is this is seeing it yeah beautiful. seeing it as endorphin seeing it as quality time with the people you care about and yeah. celebrating those non-scale victories That's celebrating amazing. that you can celebrating that you're able to do errands and not feel winded so mm-hmm. people celebrating that they can be with their kids and play on the ground with their kids and not feel totally winded and need a three hour nap at the end of that. Like these, these little, these small, um, I mean, they're huge, but it seems small for -hmm. people that don't appreciate the context. And for people that haven't lived it, these things are microscopic, but for those of us that have lived it and for those of us that are in recovery from one thing or another, oh my gosh, that's almost as big as graduating. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and wow. so any all all the little steps on the way to being friends with your body deserve to be celebrated. And helping people shift from exercise to movement is something that I love to do. I'm telling everybody. I'll, I'll give you credit, but I'm telling everybody that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will give you credit. Um, okay, so the third thing on your list. The third, be- yeah, the third thing is dignity preserving conflict resolution. And that is super important because um, it really focuses on taking shame out of the conversation and letting people take accountability and ownership of their actions while honoring they're still a good person there is a big difference between you are bad you are a screw up or like think and talking like that versus what you did was wrong Mm. but I love you or what you what I'm not okay with what you did that made me uncomfortable let's make a plan because this relationship is important to me and just just kind of having an undertone of at the end of the day, I still care about you. At the end of the day, you're still important to me. But this, this action or this event that happened between us made me uncomfortable and I need to speak up about it. Because if I don't speak up about it, it will come out in the way that my body behaves. It will come out in GI upsets. It will come out in sleep disturbances. It will come out in uh, appetite changes. It will come out in drinking urges, which is a whole different thing. But if I don't speak up about what I need and what makes me uncomfortable, I am giving my body permission to be angry with me. Wow. And so... Dignity preserving conflict resolution is essential because it keeps important relationships intact. It keeps those like, we we don't, our loved ones, our family, our friends, the people that we care about in our life, we don't want them going to bed thinking that, that we don't love them or that we don't care. We can have a horrible day, but at the end of the day, the people we care about need to know that they're loved and supported mm. and we deserve that from others. 
Absolutely. That's and that that's equally as important is that we deserve the love and the care that we give others. We are not our own exception to anything. And the sooner we absorb that, the better we will be for it. Mm, I love that. Wow. That's, I'm using that too. <laughs> Go for it. That is, I and, and it's, you know, and then if you come off the wrong way and you tell somebody, hey, you know, and it doesn't usually come out that, eloquently right that when you're somebody does something it's just you're attacking the person like you said right and and then that just never ends well (laughs) in any way for either person right it it ends up it ends up with a person feeling like they're a bad person or feeling like maybe this relationship is not salvageable Mm -hmm. but when I mean the people in our lives that we love deserve to know that regardless of whatever, like, unless it's something egregious, yeah. if it's, if it's something egregious that like requires law enforcement or whatever, or healthcare to, or healthcare providers to get involved, then that's a totally different topic. But if it's something kind of like an everyday argument or whatever, people mess up and yeah. we, if it's not egregious, we need to just give space and let them know like, hey, you messed up. You're still a good person. I am going to take a couple days to recover from this because this hurt me, but we will find our way back to each other. The relationship is just on pause. And there's a lot of space between (laughs) pain and neutrality And there's also a lot of space between neutrality and friendship. Mm. And both of those, both like the distance between pain and neutrality have certain steps and the space between neutrality and friendship have certain steps. And we need to decide which relationships in our life are worth it. Right. Because there are relationships in our life that are absolutely worth it. Yep. And sometimes we don't see that with someone who's maybe family and is, like you said, goes, it goes to another level, right? That. Right. Yeah. It's totally inappropriate. Right. And for the things that are egregious or for the people that appear to not care Mm. or just like, you have self-advocated many times and the effort to make things better is not there. Their effort to make things better for your relationship is not there. So also part of all of this is knowing, okay, I'm self-advocating and doing the best I can to be there for this person but this person is openly and consistently disrespecting me and not honoring my boundaries. And if that is the case, pause the relationship. Yeah. And if that is the case, then also what comes with pausing the relationship is, do you ever want to press resume on the relationship? Mm, right, exactly. <laughs> um, it, it'll completely depend on which relationship it is but for others that are in maybe they're in active addiction or maybe they're in active something else that has control over their life and we need to make decisions that protect our peace and that protect our recovery we cannot put ourselves in harm's way for other people and nor should we be the sole support for anybody who is healing they need their healthcare providers they need other people and the responsibility for healing is on them the responsibility for healing and recovery is on them we are one part of their social support if they try to put all of that responsibility on us that is dangerous yeah absolutely putting it very simply that is dangerous super dangerous yeah and undeserved 
Yep. Wow. Love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The um the last part of the last the last one is emotion emotion regulation and expression. Now I did not know that I was autistic until um until I was in my mid 20s until after undergrad. And I do not see autism or any other part of neurodiversity as a disability per se. I see it as a different way of seeing, absorbing, and interacting with the world. Mm. Neurodiversity specifically refers to autism, ADHD, ADD, learning differences, and sensory support needs. People will say that autism is a spectrum, but that is that, that is factually true. However, um, when people say autism spectrum, they are talking about disorder. And that is something that morally does not sit well with me. Mm. The, thing, the thing that does, that I do relate to, when it comes to autism being a spectrum is eye contact. I completely nail eye contact when it's logical. When I spend my when I spend the conversation in the logical space of my brain, mm -hmm. I can maintain and sustain eye contact through pretty much anything. When I have to go internal and speak about emotional stuff, I prefer to write it down and read it. Wow. And I did not know this until two years ago. Wow. So my thing with emotional expression and regulation is learning, especially for people that are diagnosed later, later in their life, learning how do you feel and express your emotions mm. and throw away all of what you think it should be right how do you feel and express and express each emotion when it is up to you when the ball is in your court how are you feeling and expressing your emotions now go do that and take self-advocacy and use that. So how that looks like for me is in my relationship, I'm in a long-term relationship with my boyfriend and I have a communication journal that I write my big feelings in and I write it and I will either read it to him or leave it for him to read. And he and I have a conversation whenever he is ready. And that has worked for us. Wow. Had I had this strategy when I was younger with family, my whole world in early childhood would be different. And so... That is why self-advocacy, somatic peace, dig dignity-preserving conflict resolution, and emotion regulation and expression are so deeply intertwined. Mm -hmm. They cannot exist without the others. Oh, right. And in order to, it, nothing is ever going to be perfected. Nothing is ever going to be completely finished. But my hope with providing these as my focus for is to at least make the experience of recovery and the human experience of walking through life easier and more bearable for other people. If I can be louder than somebody else's depression, de depressive thoughts, that is a win for me. If I can love them a little louder than their depression's shouts at them, that's a win for me. Yeah. 
I totally get that. And I also, um, I prefer to write things down. Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. When it, I'm the same way when it comes to uh, expressing myself. I really am not good at it in person and like mm -hmm. on the spot. No, I, I give me a minute. Let me write it. I can, I can write it down or type it up and I, it flows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. But and that, yeah. And that needs to be celebrated. That needs to be put into like, that needs to be as mainstream as somebody just talking verbally. Right. 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 And you I think we out your response. That's cool too. Yeah. And I don't think we, I don't think we realize that, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. we just don't, we think everybody should behave or react or do things as we do. And if we don't, if they don't, then it's not right. And that's, right totally I, I mean I love this I love every every minute of this so how did you find out that uh you were neurodivergent how did this come about so how it came about was extremely unconventional um my <clears throat> one of my professors in undergrad told me that she believes I lack empathy and I need to get checked out for autism. Mm. She just told me that at the end of class in front of five or six of my peers. And she was a psychology professor and she was also the director of the university's counseling um like you, you, the university's uh, counseling center. And she was also the chair of the psychology program. And my major was in human development and psychology. So this woman had a lot of power in my life. And she was not in this context. She was in her role as a teacher. She was not in her role as a clinician. Mm. And that really messed me up um, because I, for the majority of my life, I was very close and had excellent relationship with my pediatrician, with my doctors, with my medical team. I had such a great relationship with them. And for her to drop this kind of thing on me was, I felt was extremely disrespectful to my relationship with my own providers mm. and I felt uh, I went through a very long period of grieving the support that I could have had um when I found out I put the I put forward the request to get assessed but um I told my I told my primary care doctor that I should probably be assessed for autism they put in a request to somebody that does that does those types of assessments, a psychiatrist that specializes in autistic assessments. And <clears throat> it turned out my official diagnosis was Asperger's high functioning mm. autism. That's a whole different to topic and podcast episode. Yeah. But, but that was my official diagnosis and the process that I officially went through. Okay. But as, um, after the very long period of grief, after the long period of figuring out, like, actually the majority of the social reason for my depression was this reality that I was autistic and never knew about it. Mm. And, um, but after that, I began learning as much as possible and having labels for my experiences and once I got labels for my experiences, I was able to say, hey, actually, this could help so many other people. And I could weave this into my career. And I could, like, I could shorten the curve for hundreds of people. And right. that's what I'm on a mission to do. So where, where were you at in your career at the time that this was happening? I was, happening? Um, 
I was about a year, I was about three months into my work as an addiction counselor. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I, and also part of my reasoning for switching to a non-clinical role and creating this company was <clears throat> in a pandemic, I was, I did not, um, and I was in a pandemic and I was in a healthcare setting and the the way that the addiction industry, the addiction um, addiction counselor industry is set up is there are three accrediting bodies that provide certification as an addiction counselor. And the certification as an addiction counselor process, which I went through, is one year of schools on Saturdays at a um, in-person uh, in-person class with an instructor. And the requirement was high school diploma or GED for addiction counselor. I went in with a master's degree. So my <clears throat> My bachelor's was in human development and psychology. My master's was in forensic psychology. And I started my PsyD in psychology and started work as an addiction counselor in the same week. Oh my gosh. And I like, <laughs> as I, as I, um, the more that I lived with the day in, day out realities of being an addiction counselor, the more I realized Holy heck, the that like a high school diploma is not is not enough to be an effective counselor. I felt under equipped because these people were coming to me with undiagnosed and untreated um, mental health issues and trauma and stuff. I felt under equipped and I had a master's wow. in forensic wow. psychology. And so it hurt my heart so much that I wasn't able to, that I wasn't able to serve the way that I wanted to, that I had to jump through hoops because of Medi-Cal and Medicare. Right. I, I, I didn't want to do that. And so I created my own path. And I, this was because I knew, because I know that the way that my brain works, because I'm autistic, I need autonomy. I need structure. I need the ability to, I basically need the ability to create my own mold and to um, have a bit more authority over what I can do. And I also need to be, I also need to take a more directive role because mm. I'm not okay with people suffering more than they need to. They need to, <laughs> right? Get the, let's, yeah. let's make a short, let's shorten the road to, yeah. <laughs> to recovery, know, right? Okay. Like. And, right. and I and I also knew because I I saw I saw patients going into appointments with their psychiatrists and doctors and being overwhelmed and not knowing which questions to ask and I was cranky that I couldn't just go with them, like I would like they would they could sign a release of information, but then it would learn it would result in a very long game of phone tag. I would much rather and now I have the ability to. Have them sign a release of information. Go with them to whatever appointment they got to go to, and decode whatever the mental health or the legal or whatever specialist they're seeing. Decode that their the conversation for them, and ask a few more questions in a way that empowers them. Not just it's it's too autopilot and it's too one size fits all right is and like ex example is people with addiction history that are going into a psychiatrist's office for the first time they need to know they need to know how to protect their medications from others in the home they need to know about um <clears throat> that's called diversion medication mm. diversion risk um they also need to know, like, they shouldn't get anything that's habit-forming. 
they really shouldn't. Um, if they have an addiction history, the people the you know, there's other options besides stuff that is addictive and habit forming. You okay. do not need you do not need benzos. Uh, that's a good, that's going to be a hill that I die on. If you're in, if you have an addiction history, if you have a personal addiction history, you can do without the benzos. There's other different types of medicines that are plenty available that having those not be an option is not going to crumble the world. Right, right, right. It, it right. will be okay, I promise. And there's no shame in saying that you don't want benzos. There's no shame in it. It's just, it's self-advocacy in a medical setting. And right. it's something you deserve. It's, it's something that it just because you might not be able to handle benzos given addiction history, that does not make you a bad or weak person. It, there's just, there's so much heart that goes into these types of conversations that I can't possibly put into it if I was in a clinical license setting. Mm. Wow. And how do you handle that with, when it comes to changing that, you know, like how do you address that in such a wide spread, you know, it's such a widespread I mean, issue, right? Yeah. I mean, it just getting people to understand like what you, you deserve to make, you can make decisions that protect your recovery in every single context, including medical. Right. And that being honest with your care providers, being honest with your doctors and stuff like that is only going to result in better care. Right. It will. It will be nerve wracking as can be initially, but it will result in better care, and especially if you're not going it alone. That's the ultimate result, yeah. right? Is nobody, nobody should be going it alone. Right, right. And do you find that this is particular age related or... What do you find? Because I, I, I know you were in your mid twenties when this mm -hmm. came to light, how many, what do you think the types of numbers are there that are people that find out so late in life? And like you said, they've already gone through the school yeah. system. They've already done all of that. And now you find out all this, you know, all the pain you may have gone through was how do you, rec that's another recovery, yeah. right? I mean, it, it is, and fighting off imposter syndrome and fighting off, oh, yeah, that, and fighting off that like just because you've lived your entire life without support doesn't mean you don't deserve support. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just, because, just because you've been winging it and doing your best and burning on all cylinders as a way of life since you were verbal doesn't mean that you oh. deserve this. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, and uh, living in a constant state of physical stress is it may be your normal, but it is sure not deserved and sure not um, going to result in anything positive. Right, exactly, exactly. And I and like you said, it's, it's all of the above. It's the mental, it's the physical, like, you know, I didn't know, I never realized how much the body responds to these things you know I just never occurred to me it just it's just something that people don't talk about it's like two separate three separate things your mind body and soul you know yeah. it's three different things happening and that's not the case right and it's just it, I think that's just coming to light that your body I, I actually just found out about cortisol and, and all that stuff and yeah. I'm like why didn't I nobody tell me this you know at least at least the past five to 10 years, there's been so much more research and so much more like social awareness around the connection between the mind and the body. I will tell you that from age six or seven, whenever there was a school conflict or there was a family conflict and I did not speak up about it, I got either knocked on my ass with a head cold, excuse my language, or I was up most of the night with anxiety runs or I had constipation. Right, right. Or like my, my body would physically be acting out in a state of stress. And my pediatrician and my doctors kept on saying IBS, kept on saying insomnia, kept on saying all these other things. 
it was I did not have the strategy to self-advocate. I did not, I was not around enough adults that I don't think I was around enough adults that would do anything about what I was, what I would have put it forward if I did self-advocate. So, and I was getting bullied significantly in middle school because I was, because I was different and didn't know it. And the school administrators were not adults that acted like they they were more concerned about like school politics than Mm -hmm. actually uh, than actually doing what's best for kids and resolving bully problems right and so I had all of the strategy I knew what needed to happen but I had no none of the power to implement it right I had all all the strategy I knew exactly what was needed but none of the power or authority to make any of the changes. And, you know, that, that that resulted in a physical mess for me for years. But did you, I have a question. Do you, did you consciously, and I'm sorry, my dogs. Yeah. it's fine. You're watching this video. My dogs are dogs are sweet, but they're sweet. But, um, so I apologize. But, um, did you find that you knew consciously what to do or was it like in because this happened to me when I was a kid when so I was bullied also horribly horribly like my whole I hated school I despised school Mm -hmm. I quit school when I was 16 because I just I hated every second of it I never felt like I fit it in fit in I always felt like the outsider and I always I, I don't know if this happened to you, but for me, I was, I always felt so different, you know, like when mm-hmm. kids, when other kids would bully other kids, I'll never forget. There was, uh, I think it was third grade, maybe third or fourth grade. And there was a, a kid who was, you know, you could tell he was physically disabled and and it was in our class and he was he was in our you know regular class and the kids would just make fun of him like crazy I mean it was sickening but for me I was eight what eight or nine years old I was sickened by it and I would stick up for him and I was I literally went home in tears and I told my Mm -hmm. mom I cannot I can't be in that class I can't deal with people picking on him it would just drive me insane and um and they actually had to switch my classroom I mean instead of addressing the problem they put me in a different classroom right Right. but I had I always had this innate sense that that things were wrong that it was being done wrong did you have that or did you feel was it like a real conscious thing like I know this is xyz this is how it should be (laughs) So my middle school is very interesting. My middle school was extremely small. There was a K through five building and across the street from the sixth through eighth building. And the sixth through eighth building, I distinctly remember this girl, that this bully, um, this girl, this main girl who was the bully came in to the school at, uh, I was in seventh grade. She was in seventh grade. And I remember getting like getting some context about getting some context about her, and I knew that she. Um, I had found out that she was in. She had some experience in foster care, and she was ex- suspended from a public school seven times for behavioral issues, and my who I would consider my best friend at the time. Um, She joined forces with the school bully and I completely logically understood that because my best friend at the time had history in foster care as well. And so in my mind, I was, I was cool with, I was cool with losing my best friend to the school bully because I felt like because of their shared reality of growing up with foster care, being in middle school, like I felt like that was a stronger bond that needed to happen. 
I, I, I intuitively felt like they need each other to get through this period of life. So if I've got to get bullied because of this, okay, fine. That like, it was, it was, um, I, I have no idea why I thought I felt that way, but I just knew that the school bully would be able to help out my best friend process some of her stuff way better than I would be able to, because wow. I did not share that part of reality. Right. Um, it was extremely painful for me. And Hold most on of one my <laughs> Sorry. Come here. Come. Come here. She's going crazy. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It was extremely painful for me. And um eventually we found e- our way back to each other. It wasn't it Yeah. Yeah. So my best friend from middle school and I are now Facebook friends. And we're now um making our way to being friends again. But I like I I don't hold any of that against her nor would I ever simply because of like I very much honor and respect the people that have matching um parts I call them parallel points in their life right I I honor that I respect that and I give space for that all the time and I'm constantly mm. trying to put people together that have different life parallel points because people that have different life parallel points, they will, they have the ability to be each other's great, some of each other's greatest supports. And that's something that definitely deserves to be honored regardless wow. of um, your personal, regardless. right? Yeah. Yeah. regardless of like I can I can pause a relationship which I did I paused my relationship with my best friend and proceeded with my own life in full faith knowing that she would come back to me and that this wow. was just a wow and what happened to the other girl I'm know? not sure I'm I not don't sure. know yeah. um she was a very she was a very mean bully to me and most of the other and my guy friend in seventh grade actually left schools because he was getting picked on so much he peed his pants in class multiple times because he was getting picked on and he's so much oh he was one of the sweetest people i've ever met but no i don't know what happened to the other person I wish wow. her well, but I yeah. don't, I wish her well. I don't have any ill will or any ill feelings, but yeah. That's huge. I, um, that's yeah. huge not having those ill feelings. I mean, that's pretty impressive. I, that takes- I, I don't because I don't, because I just, I only saw about 5% of her world every day when she came into school. I don't know what was going on in the other 90%. And I can't say that I would have been a better person than she was if I was dealing with the same situation. True, true. And I, you know, it's, it's my mom would say what, cause I would, I was, like I said, I quit school because of being bullied. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I remember my mom telling me, you know, and I, I had no understanding of that at the time, but my mom said, mm-hmm. oh, those kids that act out or that do this, or they, they, they're not getting attention at home, or there's something going on at home, Mm -hmm. or they have some kind of, you know, back then it was kind of like, you know, you just, you don't know what's going on right behind closed doors. But my mom would always tell me that, that, you know, kids that do those types of things, that there's something happening, there's something else going on. And obviously, back then, we didn't know about a lot of this stuff. But I think of it now, and I'm like, wow, she was right. Because, yeah, you know, now you start to see that that people that act that way, it's not you. It's really right. not right. And, uh, and a very important conclusion that I made, um, I, I'm I found this. Yeah, I found this a, several years ago. Um, that just because I can understand why something happened does not make it okay. Right. Just just right. because I can 
we can we can understand the why without being okay or comfortable with it and right understand the why and still know that we didn't deserve it we right. can understand the why and still hold space for feeling how we need to feel we that's, can understand the why and still distance ourselves we can understand true. yeah that's very so, true doesn't mean that you need to accept their behavior right just because you understand doesn't mean you deserve it right right exactly i remember um I was in a divorce group and they would say they were very, you know, the whole one whole chapter was about forgiveness. And I was like, there's no way I can forgive this person. <laughs> like, there's That's not happening, you know, until mm -hmm. somebody said, it doesn't mean you have to trust them. And right. they, you know, it doesn't mean you need to let them back in your life. And it kind of like the same think same concept like yeah you can understand why they're acting the way they act but it certainly doesn't mean you need to accept the behavior right and it doesn't mean they get access to again especially right. if they repeat the, if exactly eating stuff it doesn't mean they get access right exactly and that was huge for me because that was a huge turning point for me mentally to say oh okay now I, I now it made sense and again it was one of those things which is part of my my whole journey with this podcast and everything is to for someone to hear that one thing that makes them go oh yes that makes sense now I get it you know now I can I can heal from that you know it makes such a big yeah. difference right so yeah. that's part of it yeah definitely um so what's the future hold for your consulting company and and I'll ask you a couple more questions um so the the future for my consulting company, I think, is very exciting. I think the future for the consulting company is business-to-business -business, um, services, like my partnership with the Unschool Academy of um, Business, Arts, and Science, and the individual services. So um, my individual services basically work with neurodivergent women and I can work with kids or men, but they will come with the woman. So like a part of a package, <laughs> they will be a package deal with the woman. Okay. I am not, I don't want to work with kids independently just okay. because it's such a nightmare can parental consent wise. Okay. Um, I want the, if, if I work with kids, I want the parent, the, the mom to bring the kids to me. I don't want to have to go through an uphill battle of trying to convince the mom that they, that they, that the kid needs any kind of help. I just want her to be on the same page right. and I want it to be an easy consent process. And, um, I, I could also work with men within the context of a, of a, like a partnership, like the, a woman and her partner, woman and boyfriend or woman and husband, something like that. Okay. okay. Um, but I am so excited for what the future holds. And I'm excited for you because this is like very open to it. Very awesome. I mean, this is such a beautiful thing you're doing and I, I see huge success coming your way. I know it's not all about the success. It's about helping people. Right. So I wish you so much success with that. And touching lives in that way is so beautiful. Um, Thank you. What would you, what's your definition of bliss? My definition of bliss is being friends with your body and um, keeping the people in your life close to you while having um, just having the things and the people that matter to you. Awesome. And so how can people get in touch with you? Of course, I will leave everything in the description, but yeah. I'd like to just how, mention yeah, the best way uh, to reach people, you. I think the best way to reach me is to book a discovery call at um, calendly, calendly.com forward slash um, hope reignited forward slash discovery and see how we can be a part of each other's lives going forward. Um, it in the notes and sorry my dog is barking again no um, worries at all. <laughs> and um 
and I wish you much success. I would love to meet again and do this again because I think we have a lot more little things inside of those oh, things yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> you know to to expand deep dive into I would love to deep yeah. dive into some of these we didn't even touch a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk to you about so I think we need to do another call for sure okay we will awesome awesome thank you so much Katie and thank you guys for being here I hope this was helpful and um, keep it coming and we'll talk soon. Thank you, Katie. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. All right. Have a good you. one. You too.